Um, okay, so uh, thank you, uh, Stan, because I think uh, your sweeping presentation of um, uh, Viking Age towns in Scandinavia gives us uh, a rather good framework for the site uh, that I'm going to discuss, the single site um, uh, that we know historically as Walikrum, but which most of you might know from the literature as Domburg, uh, situated in the Netherlands, on the former island of Walcheren, down here. Um, where, uh, of course, we don't have archaeology in the sense that we, that we would consider it now. Rather, we have uh, a collection of, uh, a large collection of finds which were uh, collected from the eroding beach from basically the mid 17th century up to the early, early 20th century with some stray finds uh, up to uh, the early 90s, really. Uh, um, finds that date to the Roman period, the early medieval period. So we have a Roman temple there, a Roman settlement. Uh, extensive uh, early medieval uh, cemeteries and an early medieval settlement as well. In addition to the artifact collections, we have uh, especially 19th century antiquarian uh, documents, documented uh, maps and descriptions uh, that help us get a grasp on this side, but um, of course it's very difficult to link the two, so we're always, uh, uh, well, in the dark basically a little bit. Uh, nonetheless, the site has been long recognized as one of uh, great importance. It was identified as the uh, historically at attested uh, Villa Valicum, so a royal estate, uh, which we know, uh, well, the, 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 uh, the best story, basically the best narrative that we have from uh, historical sources is the Viking attack uh, in 837, which is reported in several uh, uh, annals, <laughs> Frankish annals. Um, and of course, in the, the, the um, more recent literature, archaeological literature, the site is always cited as one of those major rigs, uh, major uh, trading settlements of the 8th, 9th century. I won't be talking about that, I will be talking about the early and late phases of that settlement, which uh, have been uh, overlooked so far. Um, so this is just to give you an idea of the, uh, the, the type of evidence that we have, the documentary records that we have. So we have uh, already uh, in the 17th century uh, settlement remains uh, appearing on, on the beach on, uh, on maps of uh, Zeeland. Uh, we have a very nice 19th century uh, map of what was actually visible on the beach then, so we have structural remains. Um, and all this will fit into a, 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 fits into a kind of a coherent view of the site where we see that this is the early medieval settlement area. Um, there are several burial clusters. This is where the Roman temple, the Roman finds were done. This is the ring fort, of, which is um, the present-day village of Domburg. Uh, and the, the standard narrative about this site is that uh, in the mid to late 9th century, this settlement was abandoned and shifted to uh, the ring fort. However, this needs to be uh, revised a little bit, as we shall see. The, as I said, the standard narrative of this site has always been based on, on the very large number of coins that were found at, uh, at Domburg. Um, almost a thousand siatas uh, are found there, which makes it, it I'm not sure about this, but it might be the biggest uh, find spot of single uh, finds uh, in, uh, at least in the Low Countries. And um, well, this, this has attracted, of course, most of the scholarly attention already from uh, the 18th and 19th century uh, to the neglect of many other categories of evidence, uh, mostly metal, metal work, but also other uh, finds. And this has very much um, defined our view. So uh, functionally, of course, as a trading site, but also chronologically, um, well, as you can see here, uh, the, it's an enormous peak, those siatas, and it has always drawn attention to that single period, eight, and of course, thanks to the historical evidence, the ninth century, as, as the, the kind of the flourishing period of this uh, site. However, uh, if you look at the full body of evidence, um, we can start to nuance and, and expand that a little bit. Um, we have two um, uh, artifact categories that allow us to have a, a time series of, of the, the intensity of activity or presence at the site, and those are the brooches and the coins, of course. And these highlight uh, what you could call the pre- and post-emporium phases, so the 6th, 7th, and the 10th, 11th century phases of this settlement. To have a look at the brooch chronology real quick, what we see here is, uh, if you just follow the purple line, the... the, the 
the total uh, number of brooches uh, divided um, by uh, 25 year intervals, you see that, that this peak which we had before in the 8th century kind of disappears and you have a much longer period of activity which extends into uh, the 11th century. If we do the same with the coins, uh, the blue line, the peak of course, uh, is maintained. These, these are the coins not just by major period, but uh, every single coin type, um, uh, uh, well, uh, placed on this graph uh, based on its, its up-to-date individual dating uh, per type. Um, if we then uh, normalize this using the Numis database, which uh, uh, contains, well, not all coin finds in the Netherlands, but a very representative sample at least, then you can see that, uh, well, firstly, the 7th century and the late 6th century merge as a very important period, uh, just as important basically as the period where we previously had this peak in the 8th century. So really, if we want to uh, discuss uh, Walikrum, we need to take this period into consideration. This is where it began, not the, seventh, uh, the 8th century. Um, of course, if there's no coins anymore, you're not going to see this late period emerge, but that is, of course, uh, the result of, uh, or that, rather, that's not no real surprise as, as all over the low countries, that this is where monetization, the degree of monetization drops uh, quite steeply. So in terms of the, the normalization graph, zero divided by zero is, of course, zero. But also there is some, uh, a, a very small number of items that relate to uh, a possible episode, however short or however long, it's very difficult to say, of uh, bullion exchange at uh, Walikrum, which would fit, of course, into this period that is when, when the site is traditionally seen as abandoned. Um, to, go, to go back to the early phase, um, there are some indicators, small numbers of uh, late Roman, early medieval continuity. Um, I'll just have, let you have a look at this, side. I won't, uh, at this slide, I won't uh, discuss this in any detail. Um, but uh, I think more importantly is, um, is the possibility that there was a ritual continuity at this site. We have the Roman temple, we have uh, the, uh, the late 8th century uh, historical narrative of Willibrocht coming, landing at Walikrum and, and preaching there and actually destroying a pagan idol uh, at this place. So um, this, this uh, very much raises the possibility of a, of a continuity again, um, not only in terms of just chronological occupation, uh, but also in terms of function. This was a pagan cult center. Uh, and uh, a, an, another reference basically dating to around 1100, uh, but which has... Um, which has been overlooked or neglected or not deemed very trustworthy, but which a, a, a Dutch church historian has kind of reinstated as probably containing some truths, refers to a late 8th century church at this place. If this is the case, this place is uh, Walikrum up there with Dorestad as one of the very early, one, one of the very, very important churches at, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, so uh, this ritual continuity is quite important, quite important strand uh, quite important theme to understand this site, I think, and something that I will uh, return to at the end of my talk. So what is the nature of this settlement? What can we tell from the archaeological, uh, archaeological evidence? Well, not much. Finds are rare. It's even rarer where we can match those finds to actual areas on the uh, eroding beach. Uh, but what we do know is that probably um, the area that was occupied in the 6th, 7th century eroded first. So that means that we only have late 17th, 18th century accounts. Um, which are, of course, even vaguer and harder to interpret than the 19th century documents. But still, we know that most of the gold coins uh, were found in this area. Um, we know that uh, from a, an 18th century description uh, that there may have been structural remains there in, <clears throat> excuse me, in the form of um, a street lined with structures. Uh, a side street is mentioned as well. So this is a kind of a, a, a later interpretation, a 19th century interpretation of this uh, by a local inhabitant of Domburg. So he may well have some, uh, some uh, uh, insight into this. Um, and of course also uh, we have the possibility, it's hard to say, but it's, it's likely that at least some of these burial clusters uh, started to see inhumation at this time. Uh, and strikingly one of the chronological dates, uh, the, the uh, C14 dates, uh, the radiocarbon dates for uh, burials beneath the ring fort, also uh, well, the earliest part of the, the interval of that date, uh, relates to this period as well. So it's possible that the ring fort was one of these areas where people were buried at this time. 
Um, how do we understand this side? Then, uh, well, I think one one way to do it would be to look at the landscape. And at this time, uh, Walikrum is situated on a barrier island, backed by well a, a hinterland of coastal marsh, basically, which is largely uninhabited at this point. It's only uh, in the course of the seventh, but certainly the eighth and the ninth century, that we see some small scale, uh, uh, well, and by the ninth century, larger scale occupation. But uh, in, in terms of a trading site, it doesn't really have a hinterland, uh, so in that sense um, it's, uh, it's difficult to explain. I think um, we need to look at, at uh, Søren's uh, idea of an open access assembly site, which is a site that's easily accessible, remote, um, uh, kind of neutral terrain where people can meet um, and can get out of, if necessary, uh, quite easily. However, we also have the burial clusters, of course. Uh, different burial clusters are, of course, a, 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 a classical element of, especially also the early stages of, uh, of Emporia in England as well. Uh, so we could look at a diverse population that's in place. We could look at various regional groupings that come to uh, this, basically this one fixed point in a, in a very large um, dynamic landscape um, that, that where people came from, from maybe uh, close by or lo uh, longer distances to, to bury their dead. But also, I think, given the ritual significance of this place, we might look into other interpretations. Um, and notably, uh, I would refer to uh, Franz Thesis' idea of the, the, the fairs, the Christian fairs, of course, at Saint-Denis and Maastricht, places like that, that structured and provided a, a framework and, and a, an ideological and even a cosmological anchoring point for all types of social interaction and exchange that period periodically happened at these places. Um, and I think very relevant there is a recent paper by uh, Martin Carver as well, who uh, especially sees something like this going on at the, the, the Scandinavian sites, um, and where he talks about uh, the, the ideological framework again, where, where exchange should be, where we should um, frame exchange. And he talks also about uh, an economy of cult in this regard. So, and this is probably the origin of then the, uh, the 8th, 9th century classical emporium as we uh, see it. Okay. Um, just, I'm, I'm going to uh, go really quickly on this, but of course there's a, this remarkable concentration of uh, golden coins from the late 6th to late 7th century here. Just to give you an idea, um, we have, um, this is a map of the distribution of uh, gold coins from that period in the Skeld Basin, so Domburg is here. Um, what we have is concentrations of 1, 2, 3, 4, maximum of 5 finds. We have 80 at Domburg, so with if I would have put a dot on here, it would basically cover much of the map. Um, so that is something that we should not lose sight of. And um, I think, again, this, this is not to be seen in, in uh, the traditional way that these coins are usually interpreted as uh, kind of ways to do exchange, however social or commercial that may be, but also, again, things that, are, uh, that have an ideological uh, significance. And Franz Thais also explains the minting of these coins in the same period at these fairs possibly as having that kind of significance. Um, so I think it's, it's <clears throat> whatever the answer, uh, the interpretation, the exact interpretation that we give to this concentration of coins, I think it's useful to consider them in more neutral terms maybe, uh, at least for now, as uh, the detritus of an ideological pro uh, program, uh, which is a phrase I uh, quite like from uh, Martin Carver's paper on uh, commerce and cult. Um, the late phase then, um, the traditional view, as I said, is that the site was abandoned in uh, the late 9th century. So the last coins we have are uh, from the reign of Charles the Bald, so up to 8, 88, uh, the 8870s. Um, the, the, the causes of that, that abandonment and that shift to the nearby Ringfort uh, are said to be the Viking Raid of 837, sand drifts. However, um, the late phase on the beach, as we can tell from the uh, re-examination of the finds that we have there. So we have 11th century metalwork found on the beach. Uh, this one is from the Ringford though. Uh, we have uh, dirhams. We have, uh, we found very recently uh, in, the, in the old collection, the Cuba octahedral weight, which as far as I know, um, is the first one within the Carolingian area that, that is actually found. Um, so this, this uh, indicates that, that we are definitely looking at a late phase on the beach as well as in the ring fort. So we should see Domburg holistically, the beach site, um, as well as the ring fort as a, a very lively urban site, uh, which typologically belongs 
uh, to the porter space that we see in the, uh, emerging in the late 9th, 10th century low countries as a whole. Um, a very lively site where we have craft activity, bronze working and so on. Uh, these are images from within the ring fort where we have a, a very a rather dense population, a rather dense occupation at this time. Um, the final decline then falls not in the mid uh, 9th century but in uh, the early 11th century and this is where we see a new site uh, arising on the other end of the island, so quite close by, another portus which lives on actually, which um, <laughs> is based also on a ring fort which is uh, very similar archaeologically to, uh, to what we should envision at Domburg, uh, but which lives on and up to this day is the, the capital of Zealand. Uh, so, uh, and importantly, it takes over the ritual functions uh, which previously were present at, at Domburg. So we have the West Monster, which is built possibly already in the mid 10th century, but certainly by the mid 11th century, which becomes the mother church of all parishes in, parishes, uh, in Zealand, which means that uh, the whole importance of this earlier church is, is, uh, is wiped out. This ritual, this long history of ritual at uh, at uh, Walikrum is ruptured uh, by the uh, certainly by the 11th century. Um, so uh, how how do we explain this shift? I think uh, uh, well, interestingly, uh, Lettiton Harker has has pointed out. Well, we have these three ring forts on Walker, and the ring forts were also, also always considered as a kind of a, a coordinated defense against Viking attack. Um, but in this case, we might reframe it as uh, as evidence for the island being. Uh, an, an arena for struggle between competing factions internally and the historical evidence historians do think that this was a period of, of a power vacuum in, uh, in Zealand so it makes sense also in a, in a historical sense um, so this decline uh, of, of Domburg the, um, uh, the emergence of Middleburg could this then be the outcome of, of such a struggle um, interesting also the, the, this this decline in the struggle might have had a, a supra-regional dimension. Uh, we have, of course, at Middleburg the church being built by the Bishop of Utrecht, uh, who is uh, very much an, an, Ottonian, uh, an Ottonian guy. Uh, and on the other hand, we have, uh, I've already shown you the, the, some of the evidence for Boolean exchange we have at Domburg in this late period. There's other evidence as well, a Boris-style uh, buckle, for instance. So there, are, there is evidence um, for Domburg having a, a quite close ties with the, the Anglo-Danish North Sea world in, this, in the 10th, 11th century. Um, and that, of course, raises the question, is, is there something political on a, on a larger uh, regional, international scale going on here as well? Um, and could it be that the town, as, as Sven has already pointed out, the town is a political instrument at this point, and that political elites play around with these urban concepts, including ritual, but also, of course, exchange, uh, and, and fortification and so on as a way to further their uh, agenda. Um, and I think that was my final slide. Yes, thank you very much.